So hello, this webinar series is scheduled to happen once a year, once each quarter this year. Today is August 18th, 2022, and this is the third one of this year. This one is titled The Duchenne Research Pipeline Explained. This is the what, the when, and the how uh, that everyone is asking about. This webinar should leave you with a better understanding of the different types of treatments and cures for Duchenne that are currently in the pipeline and how they work, which ones are pending FDA approval, and which ones have been approved. Our experts on Duchenne research, Liana Orlando and Michael Kelly, will break it down for all of us. And uh, our hope is that after this, you'll be able to hold your own in a discussion with a person or a family affected by Duchenne. And you'll be able to ask questions during this presentation. Don't forget to use your Q&A to do so. As a quick reminder to all of you who are Cure Duchenne certified physical therapists, attending this webinar contributes to your recertification, as does reading the article by Fortunato et al. and answering the quiz questions. Uh, you receive the link for this article and quiz in your webinar confirmation email, and you should see the links listed in the follow-up email that you receive tomorrow as well. If you do not, please let us know as soon as possible. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available uh, soon on the curedushen.org website for future viewing. All four of the 2021 webinars and the first two from 2022 are already available on the website under the Professional Courses tab on the homepage. So I would like to invite Doug to join me on the screen here. Hello. Hi there. Hi. And let's just, let's do quick introductions of ourselves and then we'll move right into the polls. Uh, so I'm Doug Levine. I'm a uh, pediatric physical therapist in Austin, Texas. Uh, I work with Cure Duchenne, providing education and lecturing, helping families. Um, I also see kids in the home, and I am also a school-based therapist. So uh, shout out to all my fellow school-based therapist brethren, because uh, if you are starting <laughs> last week or this week or next week, it's some long days. So um, hope it's a smooth year for you. Yes, it's a busy time of year for most. And I'm Jennifer Wallace Valdez. I'm also a physical therapist and I wear two main hats in my professional world. One is with Cure Duchenne and all of our professional development and family outreach endeavors, um, creating resources and such. And my other is as a private practice physical therapist in the Los Angeles area where all of my patients have either Duchenne or Becker, Becker muscular dystrophy. So that's a little tidbit on the two of us. Um, I'm excited about our topic tonight, but before we introduce our speakers, we love to get an idea of who our audience is. So we're going to bring up the first poll. When you see it come up on your screen, you'll be able to choose more than one answer. So the question is, what areas of Duchenne research are you most interested in hearing about? Your choices are gene therapy, exon skipping, nonsense or stop codon mutation therapy, cardiac therapy, or other. Choose as many as you like, and we'll be able to see everybody's responses in just a moment. be interested to see how this lays out. And here's our responses here. Everybody who's attending at this moment uh, said gene therapy for sure. So we have 100% respondents said gene therapy, 68% said exon skipping, 47% uh, indicated nonsense or stop codon mutation therapies. 42% cardiac therapy, very important subject. And there's some other, 5% um, said other, which those are the people that I hope we'll put into Q&A. If we're not getting to the topic that you were hoping to hear, please let us know because we probably have some information that would help you out. Okay, I'm gonna close that poll. And I we only, we can... oh, go sorry. Ahead, yes. No, yeah, I was gonna say, we usually only do one, but, um, do a quick poll with us, Doug, and then we'll get started. Yeah, yeah, just a really, really quick poll. If we could put up the second one. Um, 
we just want to get an idea. Um, it's just really a yes, no question. Are you typically asked about clinical trials and treatments by the families or, or caregivers that, that, uh, that you work with? So it's just a either yes, no question. And, and it helps us as well. And, and the presenters, Michael and Liana, kind of get an idea of, you know, if these are topics that you're um, typically researching on your own, or are they things that you're being asked about? So we'll just give a minute for people to answer. All right, so the results. Um, so 65% said yes, they're typically asked about that and 35% uh, said no. Um, and that could certainly be uh, due to the, the environment that you're working in. I know as a, a school therapist, I'm rarely asked about that. I, you know, have less contact with the parents and as a clinic therapist, um, I'm asked about it more. So um, this is great. There's a lot to go over as you saw from the first poll question. Um, there are uh, a lot of topics within the research realm to go over. Um, so I, I'd like to invite um, uh, Liana and, and Michael to turn on their, their camera. Um, and I just wanna introduce them. They're the ones that help uh, Cure Duchenne and the families and really the therapists navigate the, um, the research pipeline. There's just a lot of, they'll go over this, but there's a lot of different topics um, that are currently being researched, clinical trials, and that's an excellent thing. So, um, so if you guys can, can um, kind of give a probably a better introduction than I can of you, but uh, we have Liana Orlando and she's the Vice President of Research for Cure Duchenne. And Michael Kelly, this is the Chief Scientific Officer for Cure Duchenne. So who wants to start? I, I can start. <laughs> so hi everyone. I'm sorry that I can't see you, but I'm glad to be with you here tonight. I'm a scientist by training and I'm located in the Boston area and uh, did my own research for a number of years before giving up my own research lab and moving to the funding side. And so I've worked um, in neurodegenerative diseases and neuromuscular diseases, um, and a number of different muscular dystrophies and have been with Cure Duchenne now for almost three years, focusing solely on Duchenne and butt for muscular dystrophy. And I work very closely with my colleague, Mike Kelly, um, looking at the new um, technologies that are coming over the horizon and, and making um, determinations about what might be the most promising um, uh, technologies for new therapies uh, three to five years in the future. Thanks, Liana. And I'm obviously the other one, Michael Kelly. Um, I've been with Cure Duchenne for about 11 years, helping them really focus on scientific strategies in order to accelerate cures and treatments for this disease. Prior to that, I spent almost 30 years working in biotech and pharma. I really consider myself a drug development guy. And along with Liana, that's the experience that the both of us bring, you know, to really sort of accelerate cures and the way that we evaluate the new science that's going on out there. And you'll hear little bits about that as we talk through the pipeline today. You know, our, our, our involvement has been from beginning to end and there's much, much more to come. So I'm looking forward not only to talking through this, but also your questions and really trying to answer some of those. So thank you. Great, so um, I'm gonna start, Mike's gonna jump in along the way, but we thought we'd um, just do a very quick review about what causes Duchenne muscular dystrophy. We know that you know all of this from the work that you've done before, but this will just set the stage for understanding the different types of therapies that are being pursued to treat this disease. So the underlying cause of Duchenne is the absence of a key protein in muscle, this dystrophin protein. And the reason that protein is missing in individuals with Duchenne is because their copy of the gene that encodes it, the DMD gene, has a fatal mutation in it. And this DMD gene is the largest known human gene. And it's also even bigger, you know, more so than would be predicted to its by its size, it's also very prone to mutations. And because the gene is located on the X chromosome and males only have one copy of X, the X chromosome, it's predominantly males who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, where females having two copies of an X chromosome, um, it's much harder to end up with two mutated um, copies of their DMD gene. Although 
female carriers can have symptoms, um, which are often more milder than cases du of Duchenne, but is also a very active area of research. This DMD gene is made of 79 exons, which can be thought of as building blocks of, of the gene. And the mutations can be of any type, although in Duchenne, it's deletions, which are mostly predominant, making up 60 to 70 percent of the mutations we see in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And although deletions can also occur, or mutations of any type can occur anywhere throughout the whole length of the gene, there's a couple of hot spots where we see they tend to cluster. And so these exons 45 to 55 um, tends to be the, the most predominant hot spot with almost half of the cases of Duchenne um, resulting from mutations in that area. And there's also this other hot spot in the end terminal region, exons three through nine. So this gene encodes for a key muscle protein called dystrophin, and dystrophin is shown on this uh, diagram as this mustard, mustard yellow colored uh, protein in this cartoon here. And what it does is it interacts with this big complex of protein, which is present on the muscle membrane. And then it sort of connects that to the inner parts of the muscle, which um, form the components of the, the the contractile uh, apparatus of the muscle. And this dystrophin protein by spanning across these kind of two key domains help um, stabilize the muscle when it's contracting. And it also actually helps initiate signaling intracellularly through various domains. And when you're lacking dystrophin, such as in a Duchenne muscular dystrophy, you end up losing this entire complex on the, on the muscle membrane. And then the muscle is more susceptible to damage and it leads to inflammation and this chronic cycle of immune cells coming in and more damage being caused, which can eventually lead to scarring and fibrosis and a loss of fiber. So this flowchart is just another way of showing you what we just ran through, sort of how you start with a gene mutation and you end up with an absence of a protein and you get this cycle then of, of inflammation and it damage leading to you know, fibrosis and loss of muscle fibers. And then eventually to what you're most familiar with, right? The signs and the symptoms of um, mu muscle weakness in, in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which, starts most often in skeletal muscles, although also impacts the cardiac and respiratory systems. And in fact, this is the main cause of uh, shortened lifespan in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So the reason I put this whole flow chart up is because I find it useful to then think about all the different ways along this sort of sequence of events that we can intervene with different types of therapies. For example, you may, um, have individuals who you see who are taking steroids. And steroids is an anti-inflammatory here at this part of the pathway are trying to really dampen down that cycle of chronic inflammation and, um, and damage which occurs. And in the DMD field, we actually think that, you know, that it's not just possible that you could have drugs that acting at multiple steps along the sequence of events, but actually it might even be necessary to have be using combinations of these therapies to, to truly treat the, the disease um, for maximal benefit. And this is already happening because, um, for example, there are some FDA approved exon skipping drugs and individuals who are taking those drugs very often are still taking steroids as well. And so we already have combination therapies which are occurring. And if you don't know what exon skipping drugs are, don't worry, we're gonna get into that in more detail in, in the next slides. Um, so for the next slides, we're gonna focus on the sort of top part of this flow chart, which are all the approaches which are trying to get at the root cause of the disease or trying, they're aimed at either restoring um, dystrophin expression or expressing a, a sort of smaller dystrophin protein in individuals who don't have it. And this can be done either by, you know, gene editing approaches, which try to fix the mutation on the DNA or at the level of the um, RNA, which gets made from the DNA, 
via exon skipping or um, other types of drugs or by gene therapy, which we'll talk about as well. So these are the, the dystrophin targeted approaches. And before we get into that, one last concept um, that's helpful to think about is um, thinking about Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy and how they relate to each other um, and, how, and how that is uh, sort of based on how much dystrophin these individuals have, because that um, leads to the rationale for some of the dystrophin targeting therapies, which we're going to talk about. So both Duchenne and Becker, Becker muscular dystrophies are caused by mutations in the DMD gene. But Becker is very often a milder form of the disease. And that is evidenced by sort of the later age of onset, the slower progression, and the, the longer lifespan, which is most often observed in individuals with Becker compared to Duchenne. So at the level of dystrophin or you know, the molecular basis of the disease, the other thing which is unique is that where individuals with Duchenne really have are completely absent or have completely non-functional dystrophin proteins. In Becker, their dystrophin, they may have low levels or they may have levels of partially functional dystrophin proteins. So their mutations don't completely knock out dystrophin. They just might not have a fully functional um, type of dystrophin. And what this has taught us, you know, what nature has taught us, it's not all or none, that actually having a little bit of dystrophin function can be beneficial. And this underlies then the strategy of some of the dystrophin restoring approaches that we're pursuing in Duchenne, because what we're trying to do is give back to individuals with Duchenne some of the partial functionality of dystrophin so that their disease might not be as bad. It'll look a little bit more like Becker. So with that, we can start with um, exon skipping and how that works. So uh, on the left here is um, a diagram of the 79 exons in the DMD gene. And you know, in this case, what I'll draw your attention to is sort of the shape of the box, the boxes, because what that represents is how the reading frame of um, the, the sequence is at the boundary of each exon. So it, as a reminder, the, the reading frame is, you know, the three base pairs in the sequence get grouped and that encodes for which amino acid is in the protein. And so, you know, if you maintain that three uh, base pair sort of sequence grouping, you are maintaining the reading frame. And in cases where you have mutations that disrupt the reading frame, it's more disruptive to the entire protein and is more likely to result in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So we can walk through this example here. So in you know, the case of DMD where an individual on their DNA is missing exon 50, the RNA that gets made from the DNA will also be missing exon 50. And in that case, the, you see the shape of exon 49 doesn't fit together with exon 51 and the reading frame is disrupted. And that means that the protein translation stops and what is left is a really unstable um, protein and this individual then will not have a functional dystrophin produced. So what exon skipping attempts to do is say, okay, can we skip over another exon in this individual? Can we add a drug that will, you know, block another exon so that we can take something that doesn't fit together and make it fit together really well? So in the context of someone who's already missing exon 50, if we give what's called the antisense oligonucleotide dr drug or something that makes... Um, exon 51 also be skipped in the RNA. Now, exon 49 will fit together with exon 52 without any problem. The reading frame is restored and the protein translation continues. So in that case, you'll get all the way from the start to the end of the dystrophin um, coding, and you'll only be missing those two exons in between. And this is how you can end up with a partially functional dystrophin. 
So I know it took a long time to walk through that example. Um, and this is just actually one example of, you know, a deletion X in exon 50 is just one example of a mutation which would be amenable to be skipped uh, by an exon 51 therapy. You know, Diana? you could, oh, sure. Sorry, yep. there, there was a, a question. I, I know this might be a little complicated to answer, but um, but the question was, if, if a patient, Christopher asked, if a patient has a mutation on only one exon, um, let's say, for example, uh, a nonsense mutation on exon eight, will he benefit if that exon is skipped? Yes. I mean, in the case that skipping that, so in the case of exon 50, um, well, okay, yeah, so <laughs> yes and no, yeah. yeah. It depends on, um, so it is possible that skipping, exon skipping will work for nonsense mutations, but it also depends where that nonsense mutation is and whether any of the exon skipping drugs will work to skip that exon and restore the reading frame. So not it's not a universal all or none answer. You know, it, it, um, so this they, is actually... They... It's it, it personalized like medicine. The, yeah. Yeah. The puzzle, the puzzle pieces, the exons um, have to like to skip, they have to line up, but also yes. there has to be a drug out there that targets that specific, like, like that just targets eight or, or something like that, which there are only a few out there to date. Correct. Correct. So, um, so Yes, I mean you said it better, Mike. Do you want to weigh in as well? Yeah, I was. Just, I was just going to add that Doug gave a really bad example. You know, exon eight. If you look at it, is if <laughs> wouldn't work removed, exactly. Exon eight, if it was removed, actually disrupts the reading frame. You know, so a point mutation on exon eight and then subsequent removal of exon eight by exon skipping would be totally disruptive. Now there are examples. For example, exon thirty six, which sits in the middle of a long list of repeats. Exon 36 is a known missing exon in Duchenne, in Becker muscular dystrophy. So that would be a good candidate if one had a stop codon in there and you wanted to excise or exon skip that. That would, that's, that would be one that would work. But for exon 8, it's very clear that one's going to have to do multi exon skipping in order to restore the reading frame in that part of the gene. Exactly. Can you see my cursor when I when I yeah. hover over? Okay, yeah. so that's perfect. Because if you got rid of eight, seven doesn't fit with nine. But if you got rid of 36, you could get rid of that nonsense mutation and 35 will fit with 37. No problem. Thank you, Mike and Doug, for simplifying that. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it, it raises the point perfectly that this really is personalized medicine. So the first step is needing to know your specific type of mutation. And then you start to think about, okay, are there strategies where exon skipping could benefit that particular type of mutation? And, um, you know, based on what we know about prevalence of certain mutations, it's generally thought about 80% of Duchenne cases have um, mutations which would be amenable to exon skipping and you know with you know skipping of exon 51 being able to address up to 13 percent of cases and skipping exon 45 up to eight percent you you see as you get down the line though it's smaller and smaller subsets of individuals um and again you know it's uh it's really personalized for for the individual mutations but um what I can tell you is we already have some FDA approved drugs which are targeting the more prominent of these, exon 51, exon 45, and exon 53. And you might recognize some of their names here. Uh, in addition to what's already been FDA approved, there are lots of other drugs in clinical trials and in development. And Mike is going to talk about these in more detail in some of the later slides. But just in general, what I'll mention here is the goal of these next generation exon skipping drugs are not just to target exons which aren't being targeted currently, but also to get more drug into the skeletal muscle so you produce more dystrophin and also get more into the cardiac muscle because the current drugs are not doing a good job of getting into the cardiac muscle. And we know that that's an important um, uh, uh, part of the disease that we wanna actually improve. 
Okay. So moving to gene therapy, the concept here is to deliver the genetic instructions for making a functional copy of whatever protein is missing. And to get those genetic instructions into the cell, we use viruses because viruses have evolved to get into our cells really well. So we kind of use that as the, the delivery truck, if you will. And in Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we're using adenos adeno-associated viruses or AABs, which don't make humans sick the way like a cold virus does. Um, and in addition, we take a, out a lot of the AAV genetic material out from the inside to create space inside for the gene we want to deliver. But the limitation is, is that these AAVs are really small. And I told you the DMD gene is really big, right? And so the DMD gene in its entirely entirety doesn't fit inside an AAV, only about a third of it does. And so that's where scientists have designed these smaller, called either mini dystrophin or micro dystrophin, so that they fit inside um, an AAV virus. And the rationale for making these mini or micro dystrophins again, came from our understanding of Becker muscular dystrophy. And there is, um, in particular, uh, a case of an individual who was still walking in his 60s and had a very mild phenotype. But when you looked at his, his dystrophin, you know, if the, the top, you know, picture here is full length, this individual was missing nearly half of the dystrophin protein. He was missing this large um, component of it here in the middle, essentially from exon 17 through exon 48. And so this, you know, nature was telling us here, here's someone who doesn't have a full length dystrophin protein. He only has some of the function of what a normal dystrophin does, but his disease is not so bad. And so that was the basis of saying, okay, maybe if we can add back through gene therapy, some of the functionality in you know, the, the portions of the dystrophin which are maintained here, that would actually benefit individuals with Duchenne. And so starting from this, this construct here uh, with this individual with this very mild case, this was still too big to fit into uh, an AAV, but scientists then started deleting out more portions. And where we're at today then are we have multiple clinical trials going on with different micro or mini dystrophin constructs. So again, here we have the full length and then I'm showing you uh, the, the domains that's in Pfizer's gene therapy, Sarepta's and solids. So, you know, you can see they're lacking huge amounts of the dystrophin protein, but the domains that are maintained here have shown to be functional in, um, in, in, you know, cell models or animal models, and now they're in clinical trials as well. And the initial results are, are looking really promising. We're seeing, you know, improvements on time function tests and North Star, and we're seeing um, even by biopsies, uh, levels of mini or micro dystrophin expression in muscle. And so Mike, again, is going to talk about this more in detail, um, but we've got multiple shots on goal. And some of these are even in the, the, the final phases of um, clinical trials. And hopefully we'll be coming up to the FDA for approval soon. And the last thing I'll say, though, is, you know, all of this progress is really very promising, but it's not, we're not out of the woods yet, right? And so there has been interestingly um, over the past year, uh, understanding that some of these microdystrophins that we're putting in can be uh, recognized perhaps by the body as foreign. So you'd have someone with Duchenne who doesn't have endogenous um, dystrophin, and now you're putting in something that they haven't seen from birth, and that might be actually triggering the, triggering the immune response. Uh, the immune system to actually attack it. And so we're at early stages of understanding this. It's, we're seeing it across all of the different clinical trials. So it's not specific for one company, but the good thing is that all of the companies are working together in a consortium, sharing data um, to, to 
you know, best understand what's going on. We have only, you know, there's only a small number of individuals this, this issue has been raised in, but they recognize that we need to better understand it if this is going to be a therapy we're going to want to treat, you know, a, a broader community of individuals with. Anything you'd like to add there, Mike? No, I think that's super. No, I, I think you've done it really well, Leona. Thank you. All right. So that laying all the groundwork, I think we can get more into the uh, specifics of what's in the, the drug development pipeline. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, let me just sort of set the stage for this by talking about a number of different approaches. Clearly, you know, the central theme of what we wanna do here is address what is the main deficiency and that's the dystrophin protein. And as Leanna pointed out, the two main pathways that we're doing right now is gene therapy that's putting in a miniaturized form of this. And I'm sure some of this will come up in Q&A. And the other main approach is to put in uh, exon skipping, which literally puts in a much larger transcript, not a full length transcript, but a much larger one. And we think here in what nature has done is that size is probably important. There is an enormous amount of functionality that's built into the dystrophin gene. So a larger transcript will probably closely mimic the full length protein rather than a much smaller transcript. And so that is going to be part of how you'll see the therapeutic pipeline evolve between where we are today and what's going to happen over the next few years. So the central focus of these therapies that are RNA targeted are the ones that have been approved so far that Leanna mentioned, those drugs from Sarepta and NS Pharma. And it's what we call PMO-based exon skipping drugs. The PMO stands for phosphomorphalinos. And the real challenge that we have with that type of chemistry is that it's on charged and it doesn't get inside cells very efficiently. So the, even though these are approved drugs, it's no secret that there is a significant challenge with them and that the amount of exon skipping that we're seeing in skeletal muscle is quite low in the order of one to 5%. And the amount of exon skipping that we anticipate in cardiac muscle is probably zero. So I think that you can understand today that while we celebrate the success of seeing the first ones cross the finish line, we've got a clear problem going forward. And that's been a major focus of what we've done really to find these new cell penetrating forms of exon skipping drugs. And if not cell penetrating, then muscle targeted forms to improve both the efficiency of exon skipping, but also to do it in cardiac muscle, in diaphragm and in skeletal muscle, because all of these are going to be important as we go forward from now on. And then we're, we mentioned three companies that were involved with the the mini gene approach there's other ones that are going to be involved as well you know this is a very active area as liana mentioned sarepta as well as pfizer are in phase three worldwide trials the final stage of clinical development and there we're going to be joined next year by a few other companies ultragenics have made very clear that they're going to come back into this arena as well as Regenix bio and so we're getting a bulging feel here, really, I think, highlighting the importance of that central theme of trying to put the mini gene back in. Each of the companies have got a slightly different way of doing that. They're using slight variations along the design of the mini gene. They're using different viruses in order to look at it. Some are looking at RH74, AV9, some will be doing an AV8 capsid, and then different promoters. And all of this successfully will give us multiple shots on goal. And it gives us tremendous confidence, I think, in the data that we're seeing right now and the understanding really of what's building to be a, a, a detailed picture of the, 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 the serious adverse event profile and how that fits in, that we're looking to see the first drugs approved out of this within the next 12 to the next 24 months. I think that there, we are that close to seeing the first ones cross the finish line. I will say that Sarepta right now have made clear that they're going to go for accelerated approval with their gene therapy, and they're in discussions with the FDA to see if they can cross the finish line at some point next year. Pfizer are probably 12 months behind them. So we may see one or two of these drugs actually approved by 2024. And it's really exciting times for the whole area of gene therapy and we'll, we'll go forward a little bit further in order to talk about some of the weaknesses that are in there. Liana, if you could go back one slide, I, I sort of got ahead of myself. 
Um, I wanted to talk about some other approaches in, in the Exxon skipping world that really are important in there. Um, as, in addition to these new and improved next generation targeted therapies, other companies are moving back into the space. And you'll see Biomarine come back in with their new molecule targeting axon 51 axon skipping with a new uh, approach based on their earlier clinical work that really has taught them how to do this much more efficiently. I think the, the number of companies that are in here have expanded markedly over the last three or four years. And it really speaks to the critical importance of this type of approach because it's producing a much larger transcript and the targeted therapeutics are going after the, the heart as well as the diaphragm, as well as skeletal muscle. It speaks to what we've learned from nature, really trying to mimic that asymptomatic backer individual with a very large known transcript out there. And that there really has given us tremendous confidence that the next three or four years that's building upon all that we've done over the last two or three is going to be, tra again, transformative from therapy. The last one I feel to mention on this slide was those therapies that are targeting DNA. Now, as you're aware, DNA is one step upstream from RNA. And if one can actually go in and actually modify the fault that's in DNA, it's tantamount to a cure because then one can read off that their frame, a corrected RNA and a corrected reading frame and produce dystrophin. That can be done with CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, the work that's laid the foundation from this came out of Exonics Therapeutics and the University of Texas Southwestern and the work of Eric Olson. And there they've been able to show CRISPR-Cas9 correction of exon 51 mutated patients in which you're getting a permanent correction of the gene in multiple animal models, starting with mice and finishing with dogs. The dog work that they've done gave a permanent cardiac correction and produced up to 90% of essentially full-length dystrophin in there. That work is now embedded with Vertex, and they've made clear after the the, the, the expensive work that they've done in order to do the own clinical work around this, they will be in the clinic treating Duchenne individuals with CRISPR-Cas9, correcting the DNA of those individuals next year. So I think we can look forward to a tremendous amount of different technologies really focused on different parts of this here that are going to start to read out over the, the, the handful of months ahead and the next couple of years. Uh, just advance on for me, please. Um, as I was talking about gene therapy, we recognize right now the enormous excitement and anticipation that's leading up to the first approvals, hopefully next year, but certainly by the following year. And even at this point, we know that there's certain limitations of AAV delivered therapy that's going to hinder uptake after these drugs are approved. The challenge, as Leanna points out, is to do with the size of the virus. The virus is restricted in size, and that means that the gene that we've designed has to be designed to fit within the virus. It's not optimally designed for functionality in humans. It's optionally designed to take up all of the space inside the virus. Now, as good as that is, we really need to try to get to a much larger, more functional full life protein. And the only way that we can do that right now is to move outside of AAV delivered gene therapy and to move to non-viral de 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 gene delivery. A couple of other components of this that really we see as self-limiting are patients with pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. <clears throat> Leanna mentioned that AAV is quite common. There's probably as much as 30 to 40% of the population out there that has been exposed to it. And because it doesn't cause disease in humans, we don't recognize that we've actually been exposed, but the body still builds neutralized antibodies to that virus. The only time that we can pick that up is when those patients are going into a clinical trial involving an AAV. And we suspect that a significant number of patients will have that as a challenge. And those patients with high neutralized antibodies titers will be excluded from gene therapy. This, the last component that I'll mention as a weakness really is to do with redosing. Once you dose once with an AV, the antibodies are produced and they stay around for multiple years at very high levels that actually preclude redosing. And so the challenge of redosing an AV, along with dosing patients who may be pre-existing with antibodies, 
to those that those areas of trying to get larger transcripts are all need to be solved and that's an enormous gap that is a focus for the research team here and i've mentioned on this slide a couple of companies but there's many more examples these are ones that i can talk about publicly but there's many more examples of companies right now that are really thinking about how we move the needle from AAV delivery to non-viral delivery to circumvent a number of the challenges that we've got out there Jennifer, I can hey, see Mike. the question. Yeah, I didn't know. You're, you're so focused. I just wanted you to know that we do have a question real quick about CRISPR, yeah. if you could go back to it for a moment. Yeah. Um, the question is, can CRISPR be tailored for fixing any mutation or only for specific mutations? That is a super question because Isn't it? Is the power <laughs> of CRISPR. Um, CRISPR, like many of these, has got a, a, a fidelity of cutting and a fidelity of actually finding a very specific mutation based on a guide that we can design. And that our guide that we put in will bring it to a very specific sequence within inside a cell. Um, there's more than a couple of million letters of code written inside every one of the cells that we've got in our body. And with this guide that we can use, we can actually direct that with real, uh, real focus and real fidelity onto a single unique sequence within that there. What we've demonstrated on the Duchenne work that's been done. And I, I should actually say that it's not unique to Duchenne. We've used CRISPR-Cas9 in a number of other diseases. It's in the clinic right now in other diseases and looking extremely exciting. But the work that was done in Duchenne was targeting a very specific mutation in a dog, which is different from humans, really showing the power of being able to fine tune and direct this to almost any mutation that's sitting on the gene in order to do a single cut. So come back to me if, uh, if that's not an answer, if that's you want a little bit more around that answer. Okay, next slide. So one of the things that we talked about in the beginning was the size of dystrophin. It is an enormous protein, and it's not just a shock absorber within muscle cells. That is a functional role in order to get rid of energy as muscle cells move and force goes through it. But the sheer size of the protein shows that this has got a lot of other built in functionality that really speaks to the complexity of the disease whenever it's missing. And because of that, there's a number of other therapeutic modalities that are needed in addition to what we've just talked about. Simply taking a patient back to a Becker phenotype or trying to alter this using the small version of the mini gene is not sufficient on its own. And there's many other components of this disease that we really need to think about. And one of the strategies behind this is because today we recognize that the most optimum therapy is going to be a combination therapy of sorts. One where we're directly focused on trying to deal with a specific mutation and put protein back either through exon skipping or through gene therapy or through stop codon reading. But in addition to that, other therapies that target the chronic inflammation, the effect that this has on bone are ways in order to deal with reducing the muscle cell death are all components of what we've seen on this therapeutic pipeline. So as I talk through this, you'll see that Fibrogen have got an antibody that's directed to the connective tissue growth factor that is a very specific target on a, on a fibrotic pathway that we think is playing an important role in this disease. Being able to target and reduce or remodel fibrosis is going to be an important component going forward of how we make existing drugs or new drugs that become much more effective and the way to help regenerate new muscle. Um, I've mentioned a couple on this slide targeting mitochondrial biogenesis because we know that mitochondrial dysfunction is also a component of the disease. Exon-based stem cell therapy from a company that's listed here is Capricor. And what that's attempting to do is to regenerate muscle growth again. This here stem cell therapy is not it's stem cells that don't engraft, but basically switch on those pathways within cardiac muscle and skeletal muscle to both regenerate, reduce fibrosis, and actually strengthen it. And the early results that we've seen out of their phase two clinical trials in placebo controlled trials has been highly exciting, where we've seen cardiac improvements that have been real over a 12 month period. And that company is now recruiting a, a phase three trial in the United States right now. New anti-inflammatory agents. I know that Leanna talked about the steroids are part of the standard of care. Vermorolone is a new differentiated steroid derivative 
that attempts to separate out the very powerful anti-inflammatory immunosuppressive components from the negative effects that steroids have in these patients. And it seems from all of the data that they've generated right now, this here is quite a potent anti-inflammatory steroid effect, but still has a, a bone sparing effect as well as allowing the boys to continue to grow normally. And they don't see any effects of, for example, cataracts in patients. So this could be a very different standard of pair of approved. And right now, their phase three trials are complete and they're now submitting what's called a rolling NDA, a new drug application to the FDA, hoping to be complete this year, which would give them an approval time somewhere around about the middle of next year. Um, one that I have on here listed is a, a new company called Edgewise that is developing a compound that is specifically designed to reduce the amount of force that actually goes through a muscle. And what this is trying to do is to stop a muscle cell from self-destructing in the absence of dystrophin. And their data in the non-clinical models clearly support this. We see this as a really exciting potential standalone therapy, but combining this with both the mini gene work are combining this with exon skipping drugs has the potential to be really and truly synergistic and the ability now to actually support or even add to the effects that we're seeing in the new exon skipping drugs and the gene therapy world really is quite exciting. This is the basis of where we'd see future combination therapies. And I've got a few others on the bottom here. Givinistat as many of you may know, have just finished their, uh, a significant phase three study. They got significant data. They're now in discussions with the FDA and that their data will be submitted and completed. We have been advised by the end of this year and we would look for an approval of Givinistat by sometime again in the middle of next year. So I'll, I'll continue on to the, I think the next slide that I've got there. Um, this one here and the subsequent slides really gives you guys specific details of what clinical trials are going on right now. Uh, we've listed these for each of the main companies. All of the clinical trials are listed by the hyperlink there onto the clinicaltrials.gov site. So as you're asked questions, you can, you've immediately got this here at your fingertips to understand which trials are recruiting and where the activity lies, where the centers may be. This is the gene therapy trials from Sarepta and Pfizer. I mentioned that those guys are in the final stages of their phase three trials here in the US and worldwide. And the first may be approved next year and the following one from Pfizer maybe the following year. Solid is in uh, slightly behind these guys and we expect more to come in. The next one gives you, again, Sarepta's um, recent exon skipping trials. Their PMO essence trial is looking at higher doses of that non-cell penetrating version, but the PPMO trial is their new version of cell penetrating peptide that is specifically designed to get around some of the challenges that we've seen with the PMO. The PPMO is one that actually targets and enters cells very efficiently, both skeletal muscle, diaphragm, and cardiac. And the results that are coming out from this trial right now, even though it's in a phase two environment, show that it's well managed, fairly safe, and we're seeing very efficient exon skipping from muscle biopsy samples. We're anticipating dystrophin levels of much more than 10% with this type of therapy. And again, it's an enormous advantage of what we've seen over the last few years. And with other companies now moving into this space with their own versions of cell penetrating or cell targeting, we think that this area is, is going to go undergo a, like a real revolution over the next couple of years. Um, next slide, uh, Fibrogen and Estellas. Fibrogen, I've already mentioned, they're continuing to recruit into their antifibrotic trial. Estellas with another product application, looking at PPR delta mutations, and this is really focused on mitochondrial biogenesis. And the next one is Edgewise. This is the muscle stabilizer by reducing force. They've just completed their early studies in the background muscular dystrophy patient population, and they're now switching over to examine Duchenne patients. That recruitment should take place this year. We expect the announcement of that to come out in the fall, and that's something that I'm sure if you're talking to Duchenne families, they may ask about. So there's links to both the company, the company's web page, as well as the, the clinical trial centers. And Capricor, as I mentioned, is just beginning their phase three trial with their stem cell work. So a, a very, very busy phase, and I think the where we've built the data over the last couple of years, where we are today, 
And where we see this new technology being applied over the next couple of years really puts the whole field in a very positive light. And I think the next two, three, four years could see transformative therapies come out there. Um, I've gone through this really. Um, there's a number of things that I would just highlight for you guys. And again, it might just elicit some discussion and some questions. Um, we're seeing this continued advance in technology. Uh, the first approaches into drugs quite often in as far as drug development is concerned, you know, do cross the finish line, but they do have challenges. And it's not unusual to see the first axon skipping drugs with real gaps in there. And that there's propelled a whole suite of science out there in order for us to actually be confident in what we've built for the, the next coming years. The exact same is true of gene therapy. And I think that we're going to see transformative treatments from both Sirecta and Pfizer and other companies acting in the space. But the challenge that we've got to bring this to every patient out there, irrespective of neutralizing antibody status, particularly younger patients, and particularly from a redosing, has yet to be met. And that there is a real focus of what we've been doing this last couple of years. And I've no doubt over the next couple of years, as we move from both viral delivered gene therapy to non-viral delivered gene therapy. And I would leave it there and just let you guys ask some questions. So, um, Mike and Liana, we don't, uh, we don't, that, that, first of all, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, they have their, their emails and their information up there. Um, wanted to ask real quick, if you guys would be willing to, to play a uh, rapid fire question round, because, <laughs> because we got, we got, there were about four or five excellent questions. Um, and I know that we probably don't have time to go in depth into all of them, but if we kind of fire them out there? Can we get sort of a, a, a kind of a brief uh, answer? Absolutely, Dan. Okay. So in regards to the gene therapy, um, first of all, uh, will all DMD patients with every different type of mutation, regardless of location on the dystrophin gene, be eligible to receive and benefit this therapy once approved? Boy, that's a great question. So whenever gene therapy started, that was absolutely the target product profile that we put together around this. It was going to be mutation agnostic, and it was going to be available potentially for everybody. But let's, let's look at the real world and really try and understand what it's told us so far. Um, Leanna talked about the serious adverse events that we've seen in a small handful of patients. And that's not unusual in clinical trials, you know, that we, we absolutely come up and really uncover some things that we really don't fully understand that we may not have seen. They seem to indicate that there is certain mutations that put patients at risk from an immune response. And right now, I think that this will be approved for all patients with the exceptions of those who appear to be at risk. Until we do a very specific study asking questions about a subset of patients with those types of mutations and understand what the immune response is telling us and have the answers and how to deal with this, then I, I do believe that it will be restricted in certain ways. The second thing that I would say is that we want this to be available for everybody. And we've no idea because we've not tested very many people about who has been previously exposed to an AV and who's got neutralizing antibodies. And we suspect somewhere between 30 and 50% of the population may have significant neutralizing antibodies because of pre-exposure that will preclude them from getting these drugs. And that there really means they're, they're not everybody's gonna be able to get these things, unfortunately. And it's the emphasis behind non-viral gene delivery where we can get away from all the challenges associated with that. Anything you wanna add in there, Leanna? No, I think you did a terrific job and um, yeah. Okay, so it's not, not so much uh, that there wouldn't be benefit for certain mutations, but more um, adverse effects, neutralizing antibodies for yep. certain subsets. Exactly. And one other thing that I will say, that there's one other thing that may actually prevent everybody from getting this. And this is unfortunately just the world that we live in today. And the manufacturing challenges and logistics of actually making this available for a large population around the planet cannot be underestimated at all. You know, there's 300,000 Duchenne patients worldwide, but 
15,000 of whom are in the United States alone. Simply those markets are enormous for the type of production capability that we've got to make gene therapy available. There was a drug approved, the latest gene therapy, a drug was approved yesterday, I believe, or the day mm -hmm. before. It be instantly became the world's most expensive drug at $2.8 million in injections. So I put this in the context of the manufacturing challenges, the logistics of getting it around the world, the, thing, the things that I added in before, and just the sheer cost of what this drug is going to be, is going to have an enormous implications on rolling these things out worldwide after approval. Sure. Okay. Um, another another question, uh, uh, kind of quick. How will you address redosing if microdystrophin production affect wanes over time? Brilliant question. That there is what keeps me up at night and drives us into uh, the, the the work that we've been doing for the last couple of years. Um, let me walk into the answer by actually saying something that I think is really important. Um, we for most of the clinical trials that are that most of the microdystrophin gene therapy clinical trials are done in boys that are typically five to six to seven years of age. We've done some in older boys. We've done a few in younger boys. And the reason that's that population is that there's generally the age that we start to recognize there is the beginnings of a decline. And we want to salvage that and slow it down. But in truth, we really want to treat a boy who's a month old or three months old or seven months old. And that's where you want to capture these individuals. Now, just imagine the scenario where we treat somebody like that, that they're, we've dosed them for one and done with an AAV gene therapy, and they're growing like crazy. You know, a, a six month year old by the time he's six years of age has actually, just think of the, number, the amount of muscle that's turned over, that there's diluting the gene therapy that's in there extensively. So the younger that we dose the patient, the more likely we are going to need to redose earlier rather than later. If we dose a 10 or 15 year old boy, he may only need to be dosed once in his lifetime, but a six month may need to be dosed once or twice further in their lifetime. And that's where we need to go. And that there's another emphasis behind, we need to redose, we need mechanisms to do that. We need to fix redosing with an AAV and we need to actually move away you know, to a non-viral delivery that makes this now a routine injection. So yeah, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, yes. Yeah, ahead, thank you, Mike. I'll just add, so both, you know, Mike just said it there at the end, there's strategies which are trying to say, okay, can we modulate the immune system or hide the AAV from the immune system so that you could reduce, redose with the with those systems, as well as if we get away from the AAV and do non-viral gene delivery, you won't have those same limitations on redosing. Yeah, and can I say that the companies have all done a super job really at this, you know, both Pfizer and particularly Sarepta looking at very young children. And there was one study that was done quite recently, not the ones that we've talked about, but going after a duplicated axon too. Uh, that work was done by Kevin Flanagan. And there they just boy that was seven months of age with again, an AAV gene therapy with an axon skipping approach this time in order to take out the duplicated axon. That boy ended up with more than 90% of full life dystrophy, which is amazing. His CK levels fell from the tens of thousands back to background level. And we're gonna be following that young man for months and years to come, really to try and understand how long that signal is gonna last as that boy grows and then it dilutes down the signal. So there's science that's ongoing, trying to delve into it, get answers to the question, Doug. But there's also science ongoing that's trying to get around these problems right now because we know we're going to hit a bump in the road. Yeah. Here's one for you as well. Um, and this is a, a good question, I think, because a lot of families ask the same thing. But if a patient receives a certain therapy, will they be able to later receive other therapies in the pipeline, such as CRISPR or cell therapy? Or if they utilize different AAV deliveries other than the one that they received initially? Go ahead, Leanne, I talked too much. Yeah, no, so I think generally speaking, the answer is yes, right? We talked about if you get one gene therapy, we, we have a lot of things that we need to solve before you could be redosed, right? But I think that we're looking towards a future where individuals could have multiple of these therapies. And certainly we already talked about, you might be on an anti-inflammatory, you might be on something that 
like edgewise drug, if it gets approved, it stabilizes the muscle. And then something that also restores dystrophin, either by gene therapy or exon skipping. And this isn't just in Duchenne, there's other diseases where individuals have received multiple kinds of therapies, both, you know, antisense oligonucleotide based as well as gene therapy. And I think that's what we're going to be moving towards. Um, as part of trying to do the best we can to treat all aspects of the disease, treat it early before too much irreversible damage is done. And so, you know, when you get into the specifics, there might be washout periods that need to be have, or you can't participate in a clinical one clinical trial if you're receiving another. But I think the future is that, yes, we're going to be using all of these in conjunction. Very well put, thank you. <laughs> so I think um, the technical details and the questions we could go on and on, and that's why we have you guys here because you've thought it through. Um, but I think what one important thing we should cover because most of our audience are therapists that work with families who are affected by Duchenne is that where would they start if they want a family that they work with to start looking into possible clinical trials? Like what's step one, step two that they would tell a family to do to start looking the stuff up? So I would always, I do this quite regularly, as you know, and I think the, the team that we have here at Cure de Chien, as well as Cure de Chien Terrors, is a repository of knowledge. You know, we, we can talk not just about the science and ongoing clinical trials, but the importance of mutations. And I think for many families, they can be overwhelmed by the amount of science out there. We can try to bring that down to a level, in fact, we do bring it down to a level where families can start to understand it and ask the right questions and then make the right types of decisions. Because I really know the complexity that an individual goes through, especially just after a diagnosis and you're trying to capture the world of information out there, it's incredibly overwhelming. And so I would always start with them, reach out to the team here and we'll set up multiple meetings in order to not only answer your questions, but get you educated on the whole landscape that's out there from, and making absolutely sure that you, you know what you're looking for. And I'd like to mention too, if they get discouraged that they don't have the right mutation for clinical trials, or they're not in the right area and not qualifying for clinical trials, um, to not get discouraged, I would, I, I'm putting you on the spot because I didn't ask you about this ahead of time, but do you have a one minute explanation of what Cure Duchenne Link is to tell our audience? Maybe that's what the family should look into as well. Sure, I, I can give a very brief Thank description. You. It's um, so this is an attempt to get as much information we can across sort of the whole spectrum of the disease. And so you can elect to be part of CD link and you would fill out information about what mutations you have. And then periodically you would fill out sort of surveys about where you are sort of in the progression of, of the disease. And so this is a way that we can get more rich information about how the disease presents and progresses in a wider number of individuals. And there's also, you know, you, you can choose how involved you wanna be because there's also the opportunity to donate blood or, um, or other sorts of materials in order to provide samples, which then could be given out to researchers to help them do experiments or to companies who are trying to develop therapies for specific types of mutations or look at certain sort of things in the blood which would be indicative of, of the disease progression. And so, um, you know, what we're trying to do with CD Link is really um, sort of formalize the way that for drugs to to find really effective drugs and to get them approved is a partnership, right? Between the individuals with the disease, the physicians treating them and the people developing the drugs. And so this is a, a formal way of engaging the community to sort of decide what they'd like to do to help participate in this process. And so that's a big thing that everybody can participate in this. And can if, I add if you're a, a, another, too. Other, if I may just add another little bit into that there as well. You know, I, I, I get it that parents will look at some of these therapies and particularly hear Leanna and I talk and be concerned about, well, my mutation doesn't fit that. You know, is, 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 am, am I at a loss? And the thing that I would really point out, everybody will get to know their mutation because we all go through a genetic analysis. There are key ones that really require you to know your specific mutation are things like stop codon read-throughs. 
exon skipping drugs, the CRISPR-Cas9, all of those are essential that you know your mutation. But there's a lot of other ones out there. Gene therapy is not really mutation specific. The work that, that Edgewise is doing in a, a, a muscle sparing approach with the small molecule is not mutation specific. The Capricor work with their cardiac derived stem cells is not mutation specific. So I wouldn't want parents thinking that it's, they're at a loss or they don't fit one. There's a broad range of science and platforms and clinical opportunities there that one needs to be advised about for all sorts of patients that are out there. And I think that's what's really excellent about our CARES team is really having those conversations for your particular case, right? And seeing what are the right opportunities that match up with, you know, with the age of the individual, with where they are in the disease and, and what their mutation are, what, and what's the best chances that they have for participation. If you want to look up the link information, we don't have a way to post it here because this was just off the cuff, but um, you can go online or send the family that you're talking to online to uh, www.curedushenlink.com. So it's all together right there, curedushenlink, L-I-N-K.com. So I'll input that. Thank you so much. <laughs> and also if if families have specific questions, if, if um, you guys are are uh, the therapists are not able to answer their questions or not sure we also have a one-on-one -on -one, uh program too where um they could the family can set up uh time with liana or with with mike and um you know get more information about their specific mutation and what's available and maybe help guide the process a little bit Doug, I have to correct myself before you move on. I said .com. I don't know why. I know it's .org. So everyone, it's curedushenlink.org. Don't listen to what I just said. <laughs> yeah, and All they right. can access it through the Curedushen yeah. website yeah. too. There's there's a, a link for link. Um, if we can, Chelsea, if we can put the, the poll up um, just real quick. I know we've, we've gone over a little bit, um, but we just wanted to find out. Um, Mike and Liana, did they did the explanations <laughs> of the research pipeline in this webinar meet your needs? So yes, completely, yes, mostly, somewhat, or no, it did not. They did a horrible job, and I want my money back. This is like a real time report card right here. <laughs> exactly. And we want to we, we we do appreciate the questions. We weren't able to get to all of them, um, so we can uh, we we can send out answers. Um, we have recorded the uh, the questions, and we'll be able to send out answers. So um, all right. So here's your real time report card. Um, did the explanations of the research pipeline in this webinar meet your needs? Yes, completely, forty four percent. Yes, mostly, forty four percent. Um, and and thirteen percent said somewhat. Um, so I think that's pretty good. I mean, this is a complicated topic. There's a lot to unpack here, and there's many different angles. And um, you know, so it's it's a lot to understand. Jennifer and myself uh, as PTs, I mean, we work with this on a daily basis, and we're around the science of it, and we re read the research articles. And you know, there's still aspects of it that we don't completely wrap our heads around. So. Um, I think you guys did a really, really nice job of explaining this and breaking it down. So, so thank you very much.